examination of the hours other system reveals no abnormalities now we can go to the investigation of this patient uh, rt pcr for sars cov 2 was negative uh, cbc was done in two occasion in 21st january before admission and uh, 2nd february i am uh, telling the last investigation hemoglobin is 10.5 ESR is 109 millimeter in first hour, total count 8,000, neutrophil 83%, platelet count is 2,80,000. Liver function test is done in first, uh, in January 21st or 2nd February or 9th February. Bilirubin is gradually increasing, which was 10.6 milligram per DL in 21st January which become 14.9 in 2nd February, direct bilirubin was 12.1. And in 9 February, it has come to 17.4, that is gradually increasing. And the last SGPT is 52, SGOT 100, alkaline phosphatase is 440 unit per liter. Albumin was low in 2nd February, 1.8. INR was 1.39. In renal function test in 2nd February, February, sodium is 132, potassium 5.3, creatinine is 1 milligram per TL. In urinary, there is no proteinuria, pass cell was 0 to 2 by per high power field, RBC was also 0 to 2 per high power field, bilirubin was 3 plus. Regarding the viral markers, HBS AZ, anti HCV, anti HEV IgM, anti HEV IgM negative. But anti HBC total is positive. And hepatitis B virus DNA done on uh, 8 February uh, was undetected. Thyroid and RBS was normal. Regarding the tumor marker, alpha pitoprotein, which was done in 2nd February, which is 4.34 nanogram per ml, CA99, which was 226 unit per ml in 22nd January, which become more than 1,000 unit per ml in 2nd February. An acetic fluid was done after admission in BSMMU. Color was straw, appearance clear. Total cell count was 100 cells. And neutrophil was 45, lymphocyte 55%, AMB not found. ADO was 8.96 unit per liter. Albumin was 9.41 gram per liter. And at the same day, serum albumin was 25 gram per liter and SAG was high. That is 15.59 gram per liter. And protein is 21 gram per liter. Malignant cell is negative. This is the ultrasonogram of uh, whole abdomen of the patient, which was done outside BSMO. It shows biliary tract are mildly dilated Spleens appeared enlarged, that is 10.05 centimeter. Impression was suggestive of biliary outflow tract obstruction and mild splenomegaly. An MRCP was done uh, before being admitted in BSMMO, and this is the pictures of uh, MRCP with the and in the right side there is the CT film. There is dilated interhepatic tract, and there is a isotens lesion in. Uh, segment five, the right lobe of liver. There is other two picture of the CT film. And the uh, report was, there was rounded isodense nodular lesion at right lobe of liver extended to gallbladder fossa. Above mentioned lesion extending up to neck of gallbladder, cystic duct and common bile duct with obliteration of lumen of gallbladder. Intrahepatic right and left hepatic ducts are dilated. Impression, suggestive of neoplastic lesion of right lobe of liver extending to gallbladder fossa and upper neck of gallbladder, cystic duct and common bile duct with obliteration of lumen of gallbladder with dilatation of intrahepatic right and left hepatic duct. And then CT guided FNA from this liver as well was done. And this was done and this is the uh, cytopathology report, microscopic examination, moderately cellular material containing hepatocyte, arranged in a small cluster, sheets, and singly. A cell shows mild to moderate nuclear polymorphism, 
an abundant amount of cytoplasm. Occasional mitosis uh, was seen. Scattered large single atypical cells are seen. The total diagnosis was compatible with well differentiated hepatocellular carcinoma. And we again done a triphasic CT scan of hepatobiliary system after being admitted here. This is the picture. This is the report. And it says there is mildly enlarged, liver is mildly enlarged inside and indefined ISO2 hypotense area, right lobe of liver, which is about 4.7 into 4.9 centimeter into 4.9 centimeter is noted in segment five. There was heterogeneous enhancement with central non-enhancing enhancing necrotic area after IV contrast is causing and compression over porta hepatitis region. Multiple enlarged lymph nodes are noted in porta hepatitis. Largest one is measuring 1.3 centimeter. Gallbladder is contracted. Thick sludge are noted within the gallbladder. Moderate ascites is noted. The impression was hepatomegaly with SOL at segment five possibilities are intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma to hepatocellular carcinoma. Abdominal lymphadenopathy, contracted gallbladder with thick sludge and moderate ascites. And endoscopy upper GIT was done in 5th February, which uh, shows grade one esophageal varices and total hypertensive gastropathy. Chest except PV was done, which is normal. And this is all about the case. Now I want to ask three questions. Uh, what is their diagnosis? What further investigation need to be done? And next plan of management. Sir. Thank you for your uh, nice uh, presentation, uh, Dr. Fokru. Um, so what I would like to do, I can uh, discuss the case and um, I would like to start with the uh, panelist. Um, and we already have the diagnosis and uh, we had the biopsy done. Uh, I guess it was FNA um, and um, the treatment, the next uh, most important thing is the treatment plan. Uh, before I go to the panelists and uh, to give their opinion, my question is, did the patient had a CT chest done uh, for staging? Sir, we did, uh, nah, no, sir, there was no CT chest done as the chest X was normal and he had no symptoms at that time. Okay, also. okay. All right, so, um, uh, since uh, Shoknil actually was involved, I, I'm guessing he's involved in the case. So uh, he uh, probably uh, will know, uh, you know, he, I will um, have him, uh, you know, give his opinion at the last, but I'll, I can start with, uh, with um, other, do you know anybody in the panelist? I know there, there are three there. Anybody in the panelist know the case, or I would like to start with somebody who doesn't know the case so that we have uh, some uh, different input, and then we can go to somebody who know the case. And uh, is Dr. Uh, Dr. Abdul Rahim? Do would you like to start or? This case is uh, for, uh, case presented by Dr. Farooq Islam is very critical. I think mm -hmm. it is the uh, obstructive on this and also cirrhosis of liver, maybe biliary cirrhosis. Obstructive donors may be due to cholangiocarcinoma or other causes and ascites due to biliary cirrhosis, secondary biliary cirrhosis. What will be our management? It depends on um, management of cirrhosis and after drying of the ascites, we may do ERCP. Uh, thank you, Dr. Abdul Rahim. Uh, is Dr. Sheikh Mohammed uh, Nuri Alam Dew is here? Uh, unfortunately, Dew cannot join. He has some issues with internet. Okay, okay. Uh, Dr. Alakumaraha, Professor Alakumaraha. Alok, are you here?
Um, I'm not sure whether he's having. Um, uh, I think, Barry, do, would you like to add something? Yeah, I, I do have a few questions. Uh, uh, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Uh, and it's a very, very good case and very well presented. A few information I need to know. Yes, sir. One is, does, does this patient have serological tests done for a few things? One is a hepatitis profile. Did you guys do that? Yes, sir. And what was the result of that? Sir, HBS AZ was negative and HBC total was positive and hepatitis B virus DN was undetected. And this is the hepatitis B panel. Hepatitis C virus was negative, sir. Hepatitis A uh, and, and... Yes, sir. Good, good. And, and what about the autoimmune panel? Sir, no, sir. We did not... Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, sir. Right? Yeah, they did not do the autoimmune panel, sir. Okay. So, and as we did not do any autoimmune panel, and yes, uh, we, on, the, on, on the histology, Obviously, there is no evidence of, uh, you know, um, uh, liver cirrhosis. I mean, that's that's for sure. And uh, I didn't see any obvious evidence of primary biliary cirrhosis or biliary cholangitis. Uh, that is also another thing. So, is is this patient has uh, some kind of autoimmune hepatopathy leading to liver cirrhosis? Is not not evidence from your data. Is is, is that right? Yes. Sir. Okay, so at least we can get out from that path. Uh, and the serological finding of uh, hepatitis is also negative. Uh, so there is no underlying um, uh, known hepatitis. Uh, certainly, um, this, this, this is a very uh, good case where you see the triad of uh, porta hepatitis obstruction, uh, which you see um, a classic case where the patient present with ascites, uh, obstructive jaundice, now, interestingly, this is a secondary case where the, the, the portal structure, mostly the cystic duct, which is like a Var Varkos triad, a typical picture of Varkos trial, but uh, you have a very obvious diagnosis from FNSC that it is a primary hepatocellular carcinoma. Now, my question is, do you have any alpha fetoprotein or yes, any sir. kind of cell? What is the result yes, of sir. that? Alpha fetoprotein was four nanogram per liter. That was normal. And sir, CA ninety nine was high. At first instant, uh, it was more than two hundred. After two weeks, it comes more than thousand. Sir, may I ask a question regarding this, sir? Yes, sir. This patient is a, a bit peculiar to me as it has a history, yeah, cytopathological evidence of HCC, but present uh, the case is presenting as obstructive jaundice. Is it common in practice, sir? This is my first question. Can HCC cause uh, uh, portal hepatitis obstruction and can cause obstructive jaundice? And if this is a purely case of HCC, not uh, cholangiocarcinoma, this is if the case, then why alpha protein is normal and CA99 is high, sir? Thank you. Um, you know, if you do the database um, for, um, um, for CA19-9, when I was a fellow 50, uh, 22 years ago in, in, in uh, SUNY, Brooklyn, I published a, a, a article about CA199 level in cholangiocarcinoma, and many benign cases can cause this high, and many other interbiliary or hepatic cases it can be higher. So it's not very sensitive when it comes to a diagnostic yes. measure. Now yes. you raise a very very valid question. This is a very atypical case of a primary hepatocellular carcinoma, which presented like that. But if you look at the differential diagnosis of a patient who's presenting with obstructive jaundice with ascites. Um, and one of the differential diagnoses can be just like this. So this is, uh, this is very rare, but this is well-documented that it can be possible. Also, you know a good number of cases where you may not see significant rise of alpha fetoprotein, but the patient can have hepatocellular carcinoma. Yes, sir. So we, we know all those, but it's very, very enlightening to see all those in one case. So obviously this is a very, very good case where you see all those, but the patient has primary hepatocellular carcinoma. Obviously, you know, in, in, in our clinical setup, um, um, we, should, we, we, we could have done the triphase CT before we do the intervention. So we try to do intervention as a last thing and the diagnosis could be done uh, with the triphasic CT or we have, we have MRI with... 
MRI with yep. gadolinium scan uh, of this case uh, well. Um, so you only thing to give you a rigid diagnosis and needed the liver biopsy, which you have done in this case, is that you have negative uh, alpha fetoprotein. So this is certainly positive, uh, certainly possible, but it's a very atypical presentation of primary hepatocellular carcinoma with local lymph node metastasis. And look like from the CT scan and triphasic CT that you have only one lesion right near the portal hepatitis. Yes, sir. So yes, sir. it's a fascinating, fascinating case. Hmm. It's a great case. Right. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Doctor uh, Fakul Islam. So uh, before I uh, go to, I don't, I don't know if anybody else is here. Uh, to uh, Professor Al Mahatab, uh, I, I would like to just make some few comments, and uh, a lot of the things uh, uh, has Doctor Atik has already eluded a uh, few things. But uh, so if we look at the case, there are two things going on, right? So we have somebody who has liver issues. So whether or not patient has underlying cirrhosis or not, uh, although you, and this is something I, I, I you know I will hear from um, um, uh, Professor Mahatab later on. So when the is it a, is it actual biopsy was done? Uh, because when you do a biopsy, sometimes you may see background liver, sometimes you may not see background liver, whether the patient has underlying cirrhosis or not, uh, or it's just a fine needle aspiration. So I, I don't know what is the exact way it's being done, which I will hear from uh, Mahatab later on. So. The, the, you know, patient has ascites, patient has portal hypertension. So the patient does have underlying liver disease. The question is what's, you know, what is the cause of it? And you did the initial workup. I think I mentioned, you know, the so other workup, uh, probably probably something I'm sure you guys have, you know, uh, did it. Uh, so the most common ideology would, I think, in Bangladesh perspective could be whether or not patient has underlying fatty liver, which has been undiagnosed and now have cause cirrhosis. So that's one thing that now has ascites and the EGD shows patient has, you know, pharesis and all that. Uh, any, um, the second thing is uh, the, the liver mass. So the liver mass, you know, we have the biopsy proven HCC. And uh, one um, question you brought is the, whether why AFP is normal, as I think I mentioned, AFP can be normal in, in a lot of cases of HCC. The possible explanation for um, high CN99 uh, because, and that explains the elevated bilirubinase is probably mass is compressing, which in the portal triad, so it's compressing the bile duct and, and causing this elevated bilirubin. And you have a bilirubin obstruction that can raise your CN99, as I think I mentioned, you can have elevated CN99. The other less likely possibility, if I'm, I'm assuming the enough tissue was, was you know, was, was, um, um, taken at the time of biopsy, you know, sometimes you have something called a mixed variant uh, carcinoma, which is called hepatocolangio. So uh, if it was enough tissue was, um, was taken, then probably, you know, it's not the case, but that's another, another possibility. So that's where the diagnosis goes. You have HCC and the most likely cause of a jaundice is, is causing biliary obstruction, the mass, you know, effect on the biliary, you know, tree causing that. And um, and then of course uh, the CT chest you need to do it you know to staging the cancer you know chest X-ray can be normal so that's something you know because patient already has uh, 4.9 centimeter tumor has some lymphadenopathy which is not so big I mean it's 1.3 but that could be reactive or it could be metastatic but CT chest uh, so that's something you need to have it done and then uh, this uh, biliary obstruction needs to be uh, relieved because. The treatment will depend on how much uh, hepatic function improve or bilirubin improve because there's not much you can do uh, if your bilirubin is still 17, like some type of local regional therapy like TACE or some other treatment. If your bilirubin of 17, it's too high to for a patient to undergo TACE. Um, you know, uh, if you do a ERCP and relieve the obstruction and the bilirubin comes down, I don't know what his patient functional status is overall. So that's another thing. That also matter that uh, what functional status patient has. Um, so we'll hear from uh, Professor Mahatab, see what ultimately patient had, or you can present it. And um, uh, Mahatab, uh, Professor Mahatab, do you have anything to add? Or I, because I, I'm, I'm assuming you know a little bit of the case. So now I think uh, you have uh, the most of the points have been covered. The uh, 
you know, the possibility of a uh, hepatocholangiocellular uh, carcinoma is there. There is also uh, what we have suggested that it uh, could have been uh, intrahepatic cholestasis caused by compression <clears throat> of the, uh, the hepatic ASL itself. Uh, uh, you were asking about how we establish diagnosis in such cases. Usually uh, with ascites, we don't go for liver biopsy. Uh, mm -hmm. So when uh, we have such, uh, uh, you know, um, confusions, whether there's underlying liver cirrhosis or not, we offer some indirect evidences. Uh, one can be, uh, you know, trying to assess whether the patient has portal hypertension or not. And we can do that by two means. The non-invasive mean is uh, by a duplex ultrasound looking into the portal vein, hepatic uh -huh. vein, and also we can take a look at the uh, hepatic vein and IVC as well, uh, trying to look at Bertieri syndrome, because you know that in this part of the world, appear, especially among the uh, low social income status people, that is an, a not so infrequent issue. Other thing we do now is uh, we can do hepatic venous pressure gradient measurement, uh, which yeah. we do in a cath lab. And that is also doable. So these are the things uh, uh, that perhaps we would like to do uh, in this patient. Uh, biopsy is something that we frequently in this country, uh, but uh, for a diagnosis of liver cirrhosis with such obvious findings, usually we don't go for a liver biopsy. Uh, diagnosis made before that. Uh, but it does not mean that we don't go for a liver biopsy when we have ascites. We usually tend to avoid, but we can do that. Thank you. Right, right. So, to, okay. so other question I have is triple phase CT because, uh, like I think I was mentioning, in in you know in uh, Western uh, world, we most of our HCC we diagnose by imaging, like either do a triple phase CT or MRI. We usually rarely do biopsy, but ten to twenty percent of the time. And in the report, we'll mention that there is arterial phase enhancement and washout on the portal phase or delayed phase. Uh, that's where you get the triphasic CT. So I didn't see in the report though, so I don't know. I agree. That for, our, for our center also, it's I mean, a uh, routine thing to do a baseline triphasic CT for every patient uh, uh, that we see. Uh, for any mm -hmm. uh, cirrhosis patient, uh, it is almost mandatory that we do a, a triphasic CT unless the patient is unaffordable and even cannot afford the CT at BSMMU. So that mm -hmm. is the issue. And um, uh, But there is a bit of challenge. Uh, uh, there's still uh, no consensus in this country as to who will treat an ACC patient. So the management of ACC varies uh, depending on who is managing the case. Uh, when a hepatologist is managing the case, we don't uh, uh, you know, emphasize that much on a tissue diagnosis. In most cases, we'll uh, depend on a combination of imaging uh, alpha vitrovitin plus minus and go for treatment. But when they go to the conventional oncologists, uh, they will uh, not treat, no matter however obvious the evidence is, without a tissue diagnosis, that is a challenge for us. Uh, and again, the other challenge is the management option. Uh, uh, we are doing, uh, as you may have heard, uh, on uh, that uh, number of interventions like RFA, uh, like mm -hmm. uh, TACE uh, in our center. We do that, those ourselves. Uh, we are also using immune therapy because we have local generics. Um, oral uh, anti-cancer drugs like lenvatrib, sulafin are also being used. On the contrary, uh, we see still intravenous chemotherapies and also uh, traditional radiotherapy, not high fraction radiotherapy, is being used in certain centers. So uh, that is a challenge, you know, for ACC management. Thank you. Right, right. You're absolutely right. You know, there's always a challenge because depending on the demographic, depending on the situation, you know, it, it can differ. That doesn't mean that, you know, every you have to just go by by individualize the patient and the situation. So wherever it is, the situation is. Uh, so what happened, uh, if you can, Dr. Kurkul Islam, you can tell us like what happened uh, with the patient and what uh, the further management. Thank, thank you, Professor Mahatab and, uh, 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 and uh, Professor uh, Dr. Um, Abdurrahim and Atik Bhai. Uh, do you wanna go ahead and uh, discuss the case, like what happened with the patient, give us. Mm -hmm. Sir, yeah, the, uh, this is the triphasic CT scan. Uh, sir was asking for the report and this is right, the right. And uh, right. this patient uh, was, uh, biliary obstruction was decompressed sir, by ERCP. And mm -hmm. as patient was uh, in the terminal case of HCC, as patient was child C, biliary mm -hmm. was high. And further, uh, patient did not undergo for any tests or systemic therapy. And patient was a financial condition was poor after uh, being related to condition, plan, uh, patient got discharged from us. Sir. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Actually, you're Dr. Manasha or you're 
I'm, I am doctor, uh, I, we are sharing all three from all uh, single Zoom that is from our, but I am Dr. Mohammed Fakhri Islam Chaudhary. We want oh, okay. case so presenter, are... we'll use this Zoom ID to this. Okay. okay, 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 okay. Thank you, I was- uh, Dr. Okay. Dr. Fakhri, this is a wonderful case. Yeah, thank and you. In, in, and in, we are having, uh, me and uh, Shapneel was talking about that, you know, we are having Planetary Health Academia, a global um, um, summit in, in February where yes, uh, more than 50 international faculties in different subspecialties will be coming and we'll yes. be having some case case presentation on that time yes. i'll definitely invite you to present this case this is a fascinating case Thank present you, on sir. that time and there will be a case presentation competition there and i hope you'll come up with this case Thank, thank you, you so, so much. Thank you. Thank you so yeah. much, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Dr. Froko. It was a really, thank really you. interesting case and, uh, you know, a lot of uh, excellent discussion by all the panelists. And thank you for your uh, great presentation. Yeah, thank so, you, sir. Um, the next uh, presenter will be Dr. Uh, Manasha. He will present. He's uh, also resident at uh, uh, Phase B uh, Department of Hepatology Program at uh, BSMMU. He will present 32-year-old male with jaundice and abdominal lump. Dr. Shah. Uh, yeah, I'm going to share. Okay. I want to No, there has been Nice in the shell. New shell. Wait. Seems like we have uh, Professor uh, Adnan uh, from Cox Project Medical College. He joined, so hopefully we'll have input from him from the next two cases. I just wanted to thank uh, Shabnil, Professor Mahmoud Thank you so much for bringing these residents with these cases. Um, Thank you, Chopnil. In a very Thank short time. Very, always a pleasure working with you. Then, yeah. You know, Mark, Chopnil, you are a true leader. And uh, there's, there's a lot of acad academic leader, but organizing you know, these cases and in a short notice, bringing these bright minds together. I would also like to thank all the panelists, you know, all the um, head of the department of two major medical colleges, three major medical colleges, and Two from BSMMU. It's, it's, uh, I just wanted to thank you all for joining us today. Thank you so much. No, no, we, we should thank you. Uh, the, these are, uh, you know, encouragements for our students. Now they know that, uh, you know, they present well and that you are, you are appreciating them. And we also know that our teaching is up to the mark. So these are uh, important points for us as well. Yes, yes, that's uh, that's very good point. I mean, this uh, it, it's a lot of work, Shopnil, for you and for your resident. <laughs> And especially in short notice, we really, really Thank appreciate you. it. And one of the things in, in Bangladesh, um, you have to do everything. You know, say, for example, our, our role is very compartmentalized. Say, for example, if, um, if um, Ashraf is doing hepatology, hepatology, transplant hepatology he does, then there's a role of interventional radiology who do a lot of the work shopping you are doing. And then there is a, oncologist who's doing some other part in collaboration with interventional radiologist or interventional oncologist. So here it's so subspecialized and there's so many different, different people are doing one thing, but different things, but doing for the same patients because of the resources you are planning, you're doing it everything, one person, starting from the biopsy, taking the patient to the cat lab, measuring the pressure, or even if you're doing taste and other oncological interventional procedure yourself. And I really commend that I'm, and I'm following you. I'm seeing what you guys are doing. It is 
absolutely amazing. Uh, but uh, the, the actual thing is for hyperloid to flourish, this is not the right practice. So we are also trying to branch out. Uh, you may have uh, heard that two years back, we have established interventional hyperloid as a separate division, which has been approved by the syndicate of the Bangamundu Sheikh Mujib Medical University, it means hyperloid has a branch now. And our next plan is to further branch into uh, hepato-oncology and preventive hepatology. So we are preparing oh, the documents, okay. hopefully, uh, uh, very soon we'll have those two divisions as well. So we are that's also great. going to branch out and give specific responsibilities to others also. That's 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 great. That's, so interventional hepatology, interventional hepatology, mostly like you know all the uh, TAs, RFA, and biopsies, transjugular tips, and all that, right? So those are the ones. Uh, we were, for we what we more do more is you know uh, we do ERCBs including spike glass colangioscopy then. We do some stem cell work, uh, plasma exchange, hemofiltration. These we also do. Unfortunately, we are not doing tips, but uh, we have finalized. Hopefully, by the end of this year, this division will be doing tips as well. Okay, great. Thank That's you. awesome. That's uh, great work, Shapni. Okay, so we can uh, start the next case. Dr. Shah, please go ahead. Thank you, sir. Uh, I would, uh, thank you. Professor Mamun al Madhav sir, for giving me the opportunity to present in this in, in the case. And also thanks to Dr. Ashraf Malik and BM Atiku Jawan, sir, for giving me the opportunity. Today, I am going to present a case, 32-year male, presenting with jaundice and abdominal lump. Name, MD Russell, 32 years, male. He is non-diabetic, non-motensive, and chronic hepatitis B infected for 14 years. He was admitted in BSOM hepatology at 17th April 2023. This is the picture of this patient. You are seeing the jaundice. The presenting complaint was yellow coloration of eyes and urine for two months. Fever for same duration and left upper abdominal lump for one month. He developed. Sir. Is my skin seen to all of you? Yes. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, he developed yellow coloration of eyes and urine, which was insidious in onset, fluctuating in nature, progressively increasing day by day for the last two months, not preceded with any problem like feature and not associated with itching and pale stool. He also complains of fever for same duration, which was high grade, intermittent. Highest recorded temperature was 103 degree Fahrenheit, not associated with chills and rigor, subsided by taking antipyretics. He didn't give any history of drenching night sweat, itching, nodular swelling in any part of the body, a cough. He also noticed a feeling of upper left upper abdominal lump for last one month, which is progressively increasing. And it is also associated with anorexia, fatigue, and weight loss. It was not associated with any alteration of bowel habit or any abdominal pain in any part of the body, abdominal pain. And he doesn't give any history of polyuria, polyphysia, or heat intolerance. And he has no previous history of abdominal distension, vomiting of blood, passes of black stool, altered level of consciousness, joint pain, oral ulcer, skin rash, or a history of taking herbal medication before, during, or after the onset of jaundice or any contact with smear positive TB patient. He has a previous history of jaundice two years back and was also admitted in BSMA hepatology. At that time, he was diagnosed as acute hepatitis B hepatitis. He has previous history of blood transfusion. He has a previous history of blood transfusion, six unit of blood transfusion within last two months. No history of IV drug abuse, Consanguinity of marriage between her parents or any history of surgical or dental procedure or any extramarital sexual exposure. He has no significant past surgical history. He's married, blessed with two daughters, all are enjoying good health. None of the family member had been suffering from or died of liver disease or any GI malignancy. He comes from a lower middle class family and he is immunized as per API schedule and not vaccinated against hepatitis B. Uh, on general examination of this patient, patient is well alert, cooperative, appearance was ill-looking, body build was cachexic, nutrition was below average, 
body weight at the time of examination was 42 kg. He lost 10 kg of weight in the previous two months. Decubitus on choice, he's, he's severely anemic. He has history of six unit blood transfusion, though he was severely anemic, jaundice was deep. Other feature of general examination finding are within normal limits. Our respiratory rate, temperature was 101 degree Fahrenheit. Lymph node, there was no peripheral lymphadenopathy. And there is no stigma of chronic liver disease and is shiny nail and escape mark are absent. Flapping tremor, cave ring, all absent. Bony tenderness absent. Body hair distribution was normal. On elementary system examination, mouth and oral cavity was normal. On parabdominal examination, abdomen is normal in shape. Umbilicus is centrally placed and inverted. Flanks are not full. No visible peristalsis or inverse vein. On palpation, liver is not enlarged. Gallbladder not palpable. Spleen is enlarged, 13 centimeters from left coastal margin, farming consistency. Splenic nose is also present. Kidney is not palatable. There is no palpable abdominal lymphadenopathy. Testis is normal and sensitive, pain sensitive to touch also. Hernial orifice is intact. DRE was not done. Percussion, normal tympanic percussion note. Ascites is absent as evident by negative shifting dullness. Auscultation, bowel sound is present and no splenic rub. Examination of other system shows no abnormalities. Now the investigation. We did a um, blood count on two occasion, 17th April 2023, after transfusing more than four units of blood, he was hemoglobin of 6.1. And then again, within 17 to 23, we transfused two units of blood. The hemoglobin was same. ESR was 40 and 18. Sequentially, WBC count was also low. 3,500 and 23rd April, 3,000. Neutrophil, 73 and 76%. Platelet count was on the borderline. 17th April was 150,000 and 23rd April, 160,000. Reticulocyte count was high. We did a reticulocyte count. It was very high. Then we also did the LFTs. On LFT was done in bilirubin, was done in 22nd of March, which was outside BSMU. At the time, it was bilirubin was 8.8. .8. Then we do total and direct bilirubin on 17th April. Bilirubin, total bilirubin was 10.4 milligram per deciliter and direct was 0 0.95, mostly indirect bilirubin. ALT and AST both in normal limit. Prothrombin time was 14.3 and INOR was 1.19. Alkaline phosphatase is within normal limit. GGT is normal limit. Albumin is a bit low, 3.1. This is the RFT renal function test. Urinary, 17th April, albumin was nil, parcel was 0 to 2, and creatinine was normal, and electrolytes are good. On viral marker investigation, HBS, AG was positive, and HBC IgM, which was previously positive two years ago, now it's negative. NTHCB, NTHAB, IgM, and NTHCB, IgM, AE, all are negative. HBEG was negative, and hepatitis B DNA, undetected. We did in DNA in 2021, which was undetected in 21, and now the DNA is also undetected. This was the ultrasono of this time. Uh, it is showing comment was mild hepatomegaly with moderate fatty chains, grade two, other findings are normal. Hemoglobin electrophoresis was also done. Normal hemoglobin electrophoresis was done in uh, this time, 2023. It was normal. We did a Coombs test for indicating the hemolysis, which is direct and indirect. Both are negative in to 2021 and 2023. Endoscopy was normal. And these are the other investigation we did in 2021 and 2023. ANA asthma autoimmune marker was negative. Serum ceruloplasmin is in the normal range. TSH is normal. Alpha fetoprotein, we did an alpha fetoprotein, which is also normal. CA99 is within the normal li limit. We did in PVF uh, in 21. It was showing bicytopenia, now presenting us with pancytopenia and macrocytic anemia. Bone marrow study 2021, suggestive of dimorphic erythroid hyperplasia. We also performed an ultrasound in 2021. At that time, it was acute. He was diagnosed as acute HBB hepatitis. At that time, ultrasound was slight course hepatic parenchyma, mild hepatomegaly, and huge splenomegaly. 
in Alderson 2021. Then we did an referral to the hematology. Uh, they do they they told us to repeat the direct and indirect pump test, serum LDH, uric acid, and CRP, and serum calcium. Then the diagnosis was done uh, from the hematology department. They did and performed an bone marrow examination. It revealed LDH was high, reticulocyte count was high, and the diagnosis was done as non-Hodgkin lymphoma. Uh, it was done. It was diagnosed one month back. Now the patient is doing good. He's taking the chemotherapy drug. Uh, he was admitted in hematology. Uh, that's why I can. This is the last investigation. And we did reach the diagnosis after four months of journey. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Shah. Another um, exciting case. This is really, really a uh, very uh, exciting case. And um, from a start to finish, you know, you, uh, you guys uh, did uh, excellent work, you know, try to uh, evaluate the cause of his presentation, especially jaundice and abdominal lump. Um, so I'd like to make some comment and, uh, and then I'll go to all the panelists. One, com uh, one question is, uh, on your presentation, you mentioned there's an abdominal lump. So on your exam, I, I might have missed it. Uh, did you guys see any lump or did you, uh, on your on an ultrasound, I don't know if you have done any uh, like a uh, uh, cross-sectional imaging, something like CT to find out about that lump. No, we didn't perform any CT. We did an ultrasound, but ultrasound report did not say anything about splenomegaly, but the lump was visible. And patients okay, so complained left, about left, the visible lump. The lump was really the left, uh, the spl uh, spleen size that's that's causing the- uh, 13 centimeter. Okay. What was it? 13 centimeter? From the left coastal margin. Left the list. Okay. So, you know, this is, uh, as you know, one of the, um, it's not very common. You know, you see also in a hepatitis C patient, uh, lymphoma is one of the extra hepatic manifestation of chronic uh, viral hepatitis. So usually you see mostly in a chronic hepatitis C patient, but uh, uh, we don't see a lot more hep hepatitis B, uh, unlike you in Bangladesh, because you see a lot more. Uh, but that's one of the uh, present, you know, extra hepatic manifestation of chronic hepatitis B. You see non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And it's interesting is um, in hepatitis C patient, when we treat hepatitis C, uh, oftentimes, even though they have early stage, I don't know what was the lymphoma patient had, the early stage of lymphoma, they uh, actually, they respond very well to the chemo uh, therapy, or sometimes they may not need it after successful eradication of hepatitis C. Uh, but you know this is uh, this is a very very interesting case and uh, uh, pretty uh, unusual but uh, interesting case. Uh, I will go to all the panelists and um, listen their input. Uh, so I'll start with uh, I don't know Professor Farooq Ahmed is here. If not, then I'll go to Professor Adnan. He's we did not hear from him from the last case. Uh, he's from uh, Cox Bazar Medical College. Professor yeah, Abnan. Thank, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, sorry that I uh, joined late. Uh, my question is, did you perform any CT scan of this patient? No, sir. We didn't perform the CT scan because of financial constraint. The ultrasonar and the clinical examination. Then we did the hematology referral. And then they performed the bone marrow study. And the diagnosis was raised. That's why we didn't perform any CT scan. And uh, abdominal lump, as you mentioned in the presentation, lump. Uh, 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 it, it was not uh, finding in the ultrasonogram report as well. Uh, ultrasonogram was negative this time, but yes. it yes. showed in previous 2021 case, yeah, he was a spill it was there. Yes, may, maybe the patient uh, complained about abdominal lump. It may yeah. be due to spanomegaly, yes, the possibility. Uh, and the patient has jaundice and fever. Uh, yes, I think jaundice uh, it is due to the uh, decompensation of uh, cirrhosis. Uh, the ultrasonogram says that there is only mild, mild uh, coarse cicotecture of liver, uh, but uh, the patient developed jaundice uh, recently yes, along with fever. Uh, this jaundice uh, may be explained by uh, decompensation, as as you showed that 
the uh, uh, unconjugated bilirubin is much more than conjugated bilirubin. Uh, that's why it is consistent with uh, decompensation of cirrhosis. Uh, another, another point is, uh, can you repeat the uh, uh, comment of hematologist after? Yes, sir. Uh, uh, the picture. Thank you for actually. your kind. Uh, thank you for your kind referral. We would like to do the direct and indirect cum tests from transfusion medicine department. We did perform a cum test, which was negative in both cases. Transfusion medicine department was also negative. LDH was high. Uric acid was high. CRP was high because it was an infection. Calcium was normal, and they did want to perform a bone marrow study with trifen biopsy. Uh, patient was then shifted to hematology that it revealed non-Hodgkin lymphoma uh, with I guess, uh, Doctor uh, Professor Adnan's question: How, uh, what is, how do you explain this hyperbilirubinemia? Was it uh, direct or indirect? Uh, it was mostly indirect, but okay. a lymphoma can cause both indirect and direct hyperbilirubinemia. In both lymphoma can cause uh, jaundice in many ways. That's why it patient has got hemolysis. Patient has got increased reticulocyte count, increased LDH. That's why it may be mostly indirect bilirubinemia, hyperbilirubinemia. Okay. So indirect, that explains, right? So if indirect hyperbilirubinemia, it's most likely for hemolysis, as you mentioned, uh, high reticulocyte count and, uh, and LDH, this all explains, uh, you know, in uh, hemolysis from the from the lymphoma uh, causing uh, hyperbilirubinemia. And your yes. ultrasound did not show any bile duct uh, abnormalities, so that's unlikely uh, any bile duct um, uh, uh, in obstruction. Now, we know it, the, the lymphoma is a patient has, I mean, the one thing I'm sure the hematology will get it uh, to find out uh, about if there's a lymphadenopathy anywhere else, you know, either they will do like a PET CT. Uh, although lymphoma is rarely involved liver, uh, it's not very common, but, you know, uh, that's something eventually patient will need some type of cross-sectional imaging to, to find out about it. But mostly it sounds like it's, uh, you know, uh, something uh, non oxygen lymphoma. I'm sure the patient, sometimes you may not see any lymphadenopathy in the whole body. Yes, sir. So uh, you just diagnose it by just a bone marrow biopsy. That, that answer your questions, Professor Adnan? Yes, yes, that's right. Uh, I also yeah, think that the uh, uh, lymphoma, lymphoma can well explain the uh, high unconjugated bilirubin. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Adnan, for your valuable input. Uh, then next, I'll go to um, Associate Professor Abdul Rahim. Thank you, moderator, and thank you, uh, Planetary Health Academia. I have some questions about Dr. Manoj. Uh, what, is, what are the causes of fever of this patient? Uh, so lymphoma can itself put the cause of fever? Yes, sir. Uh, lymphoma itself can cause fever, but patient has yes. got infection. Uh, but, uh, why he, he is suffering from jaundice? Uh, uh, sir, lymphoma in this case most likely causing hemolysis. But if the lymphoma involves the protohepatitis lymph nodes, or it may cause but, obstructive. Uh, you have mentioned he is suffering from SBS is the ICM positive. Uh, it, it was, sir, 2021. Maybe acute, acute insult of hepatitis B? Yes, sir. It may be. It may be. It may thank be, you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Manoj. This is a very interesting case. Uh, thank you. Also, the moderator. Thank Ramon. you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Professor Abdul Rahim. Now, we'll go to uh, Professor Alok Kumar Raha from Chiraga Medical College. Alok? Not sure uh, he's having good connection or not. Uh, in that case, uh, I'll go to uh, Atik Bhai. Thank you. Um, thank you, um, Ashraf, uh, Shafnil, and Manosh. Manosh, it's a very good case. Your thank case. You, and you know, there's a very, very good output also by Professor Adnan and Professor Rahim. 
So obviously this patient has decompensation uh, and the liver cirrhosis, he pointed out very well. Um, there's few things also came out from this case, which we may not see very often, but which is very common. Um, one fascinating thing is hepatitis B induced hemolytic anemia, which is exceedingly rare, but can be possible and can happen. We see it all the time. Also, we know the leading cause of increased risk of hepatocellular carcinoma is hepatitis B, as well as also B cell non Hodgkin lymphoma is very common. And in this case, that happened. So, um, and uh, we also know, and you also mentioned that uh, non Hodgkin lymphoma itself can cause hemolysis. Uh, non Hodgkin lymphoma itself can cause a lot of autoimmune phenomenon in the body, including unexplained fever and all those things. So, this is a very good case for us who practice in um, in uh, in America or uh, European countries. We don't see hepatitis B not as much as you see, and yes, um, you also bring the perspective of uh, hematology, autoimmune phenomenon. Uh, in this case, obviously, in this case we could have uh, done few other things. Uh, but I totally understand the restraint, um, um, economic and uh, resources. And that's why what we do typically, it wasn't done there. But I would say that what you have done, it led to a very quick diagnosis in a short time. And the patient is getting the treatment. So I think this is a very good case, a very good case uh, from very different perspective. And I would also congratulate you to present this case, very nice case a good learning uh, case for many subspecialty. And uh, I would definitely also uh, invite you to join in our uh, you know, the global summit uh, uh, with this case as well. Thank you very much, uh, all the panelists. And thank you, thank Shapnil. You, okay, thank you, uh, Atik Bhai. Um, now I will ask uh, uh, Professor Matab uh, to uh, give his uh, valuable opinion. Uh, if you'd like to add something, <clears throat> Shopnil. I think uh, the different aspects are well covered. I have uh, little to uh, add uh, here. Uh, uh, I think uh, I think by and you have uh, and the panelists, especially Abdan, has covered all the, the different aspects. Okay, thank you, thank you, uh, Shopnil. You got uh, some uh, exciting cases, Shopnil. <laughs> Those are really, really great cases. So. Um, the next one, um, I will uh, ask next case. I think, you know, uh, uh, you know Ashraf uh, and Shapil, both you are here. This is mm -hmm. such a great cases. We should mm -hmm. do at least every three months, one case sessions with the hepatology department. Absolutely. And we, I... and we would we would bring a lot of Western uh, hepatologists to see these cases. Yes. This, yeah, is, this exactly. is fascinating. Yeah, it is. It is. Yeah, definitely. I agree with you, I think. Bye. Yeah. The next one, uh, I will ask uh, Dr. Rizwanu Rahman. Uh, he's also a phase B resident at Department of Hepatology at BSMMU. He will present 24-year-old pregnant lady presented with abdominal distension and altered level of consciousness. Uh, from the uh, initial uh, uh, statement, it also sounds like it will be a, a fascinating case as well. So please, uh, Dr. Rahman, go ahead. Uh, thank you, sir. Honorable panelist, esteemed uh, chairperson, moderator, and my dear colleagues, welcome you all to my case presentation. I'm Dr. Mohammad Rezwan Rahman, resident phase B, Department of Hepatology in Bangabandhu Sheikh Mudi Medical University. So, my patient, Mrs. Tanjila Khan Liza. 24 years old, normotensive, non-diabetic, diagnosed case of Wilson's disease with 17 weeks of pregnancy. Uh, hailing from Tangail was shifted into our department from neurology department, BSMMU, on 1st August 2023 with the complaints of abdominal distension for five days and altered level of consciousness for one day. The abdominal distension was progressively increasing. There was no facial puffiness, it was associated with leg swelling, and there was no history of chest pain, palpitation, orthopnea, shortness of breath, skin rash, joint pain, heat or cold intolerance. 
patient also developed altered level of consciousness for last one day, which was where she was disoriented about time, place, and person and drowsiness for last one day. She responded to only painful stimuli, and it was also associated with difficulty of speech, difficulty of movement in both upper and lower limbs. But it was not associated with any fever, convulsion, head trauma, or fall. She, she had no previous history of generalized abdominal distension, or the level of consciousness, surgery, dental procedure, drug abuse, or needle sharing. On background history, patient was diagnosed case of Wilson's disease for last 14 years. A diagnosed case of Wilson's disease since 2009, when she was 11 years old. Diagnosis was done during evaluation of jaundice and fever in BSR. She was initially put on deep penicillamine for two years up to 2011. Then patient stopped taking medications as per his, her physician's advice, but was on regular follow-up with physicians without any drug since 2011. Six years back, patient had one episode of blood means vomiting and was managed conservatively at Tangai Southern Hospital, but was not referred to Dhaka for further evaluation. About one year back, in October 2022, she developed tremor in both hands, aggravated on attempted movement, believed by rest. Initially, it was mild and then slowly progressive. She consulted with her physician and was prescribed tablet procyclidin hydrochloride and symptoms improved partially. March 2023, she conceived for second time. The tremor was increasing. She consulted with several physicians, but the tremor persisted. At 13th week of gestation, that is on June 23rd, 2023, she developed severe pain in both legs. She couldn't wake up on her own, could walk a few steps, but with difficulty or help of others. There was no alteration of consciousness or difficulty in speech. She was initially admitted to Central Police Hospital and then was referred to BSMMU Neurology Department for further evaluation and management. On 26 June 2020, she was admitted in Neurology Department, Bangabandhu Sheikh Modi Medical University, and was treated with dipenacillamine, carbidopa levodopa combination, and trihexyphenidyl hydrochloride. On 3rd July 2023, patient developed parvaginal bleeding. Consultation from Department of Gynean Obstaken, and they advised progesterone tablet orally 200 milligram and the bleeding subsided. On 26 July 2023, patient developed lower abdominal pain. We again, consultation was taken from Fetomaternal Medicine Department, but no obstetric cause was found for lower abdominal pain. On 31st July 2023, patient developed altered consciousness. Consultation was taken from Department of Hepatology and was patient was diagnosed as grade three hepatic encephalopathy. Treatment was given and recommended to shift the patient to our department. And then on 1st August 2003, the patient was shifted in our department with altered level of consciousness. Patient was treated with conservative management as per protocol and her encephalopathy improved. But unfortunately on 7th August 2023, the patient developed hematemesis and malady. Conservative management was given with IV fluid and blood transfusion. On 9th August 2023, first session endoscopic variceal band ligation was done with proper counseling and precaution. On 10th August 2023, patient again become drowsy, developed grade three hepatic encephalopathy, and then patient was shifted to ICU. In the ICU, she was managed with broad spectrum antibiotics, suppressors and blood transfusion about two years on 14th august after improvement of patient's well-being she was again shifted to hepatology department on 18 august patient developed multiple bullous lesion on left leg 
consultation was taken from dermatology department and porphyria cutanea tarda was excluded by Woods lamp study. Condition improved after applying paraffin cream. On 13 August 2023, patient again developed black tarry stool for several locations, but no blood mix vomiting, no alteration of consciousness. Patient was managed with injection tarlipresin, one milligram six hourly, and then the condition improved. There is no family history of consanguinity, consanguinity between parents. Patient is married, has no siblings, blessed with one son, every one of his family member enjoying healthy life. None of the family members had been suffering or died from liver disease. Her menstrual cycle was regular with adequate flow and duration. She is second gravida. There is no history of fetal loss, abortion, stillbirth. Her first pregnancy was uneventful with history of lower uterine and section in 2019. She is a housewife, comes from lower middle class family, studied up to HSC, and she's vaccinated against COVID-19 and immunized as per DPI schedule, but not vaccinated against hepatitis B virus. On general examination, patient was ill-looking, moderately anemic. There was presence of palmar erythema and bipedal edema. Other parameters were normal with vital signs were also normal. Patient flapping tremor could not be evaluated due to her weakness and KF ring was also present. JVP was not raised, there is no lymphadenopathy, and other stigma of cirrhosis was absent. Skin condition, there was multiple bullous lesion on left leg, pressure sore on right feet, toe, multiple maculopapular rash on chest, upper and lower back. Elementary system examination. Mouth and oral cavity, there was presence of oral ulcer. Parabdominal examination, inspection, abdomen is distended, Umbilicus is centrally placed and inverted, flanks full, no visible peristalsis or visible swelling, there, but there was presence of stria all over the abdomen and engorged vein also present, direction was away from umbilicus. There is no muscle guard, hyperesthesia, residue, tenderness. On deep palpation, no lump or tenderness were present, no organomegaly, arneal orifices were intact, diary was not done. Shifting dullness was positive, bowel sound is present, and fetal heart sound was also present. Neurological examination, higher cerebral function, patient's GCS was 10 out of 15, that is eye opening, four, verbal two, and motor four, Speech, incomprehensible sound only. Cranial nerve examination shouldn't be done. Motor examination, motor function, muscle bulk was normal. Muscle tone was increased. Muscle part, power, two by five. Both proximal and distal part are both upper and lower limbs. Reflex, wrist, and plantar reflex, bilateral extension. Sensory function could not be evaluated. Cerebellar function could not be evaluated and coordination and gait could not be evaluated. Other system examination reveals no abnormalities. Now about investigation report. We have several CBC reports from 24 June 2023 to till 5th September 2023. So here we can see that the hemoglobin was initially 11.7, but progressively there is decrease of hemoglobin. And on last, on fifth in stand, hemoglobin was 9.9. .9. Yes, sir, was normal, but total count was 15,000 in the last CBC report. Uh, there is neutrophil count 78% and platelet count was two lakhs. PF report was also done on fifth in stand, which revealed moderate normocytic normochromic anemia with neutrophilic leukocytosis. Now liver function tests. Serum bilirubin was more or less normal on one occasion on 12 August, it was 2.69 and latest bilirubin level is 2.05. ALT was almost always normal 
but the alt ast ratio was altered inr was 1.29 on 12 in s10 and then it increased on in 19th august it was 2.1 and then again it decreased and now the latest inr was 1.05 alphos was normal gamma gt was raised on 13th july serum albumin is progressively decreasing and the latest serum albumin level is 2.12 gram per deciliter alpha fetal protein report is normal renal function test urinary report on last month that is 12 august it was uh, as there's, there was presence of past cell 15 to 20 rbc was also present 10 to 15 sugar nil and the latest uh, urinary report shows presence of past cell 8 to 10 and there is also presence of rbc 4 to 6 Blood urea level was normal, serum creatinine level was normal, uh, blood ammonia level was normal, electrolyte revealed, uh, there is hyponatremia, that is sodium 117, and potassium is normal, 3.55. Serum calcium was normal. Urinary and urine CS was done on last month, that is 13 August, no growth of bacteria was found. 24 hours urinary copper was done last in May, 24th May 2023, the value was 55.4 microgram per 24 hour. Serum cellular plasmid level was 15 on 16 July. ANA negative, IgG negative, that is normal, and VDR non-react. Viral markers, all were negative. Thyroid function test was normal. Blood sugar level was also normal. A patient had raised CRP on 12 August 2023. And APTT, magnesium, inorganic phosphate, urea, procalcitonin, and LDH are all were within normal range. Ultrasound of whole abdomen done on 31st July 2023, which revealed liver is in. Normal in size with irregular outline. Eco texture of liver parenchyma is grossly coarse and nodular. Gravid uterus containing single fetus. Fetal head is floating at present. BPD is 37.3 millimeter. The comment was grossly coarse hepatic parenchyma with mild splenomegaly. Mark SITs. Findings are consistent with cirrhosis of liver. Single life pregnancy of about 17 plus weeks duration. This was done on 31st July. Due to variceal bleeding, first session of EPL was done on 9th August 2023. Fibroscan of liver was done in June 2023, where liver stiffness was 22.0 kilopascal and cap was 107 decibel per meter. This is the current medication, ongoing treatment, injection sephoroxime, injection hepaclin, tablet nitrofurantoin, tablet rifaximin, tablet dipenacillamine, pyridoxin, carvidopa levodopa, hexyphenidyl hydrochloride, syrup lactulose, progesterone, zinc iron folic acid, sucralfate, calcium, and ibm So, a 24 years old, normotensive, non-diabetic lady, known case of Wilson disease, with 17 weeks of, weeks of pregnancy, now, which is 22 weeks, presented to us with, on 26 June 2023 with abdominal distension for five days and altered level of consciousness for one day, with a history of tremor, difficulty in walking, and blood beast vomiting, was diagnosed as a case of decompensated cirrhosis of liver due to Wilson's disease, with hepatic encephalopathy grade three. Management of encephalopathy was done and there was clinical improvement in 31st July and 1st August. But again, patient developed upper GI bleeding on 7th August. Blood transfusion and EVL was done. The patient again developed hepatic encephalopathy following EVL, was shifted to ICU, was managed there with vasopressor and broad spectrum antibiotic and blood transfusion, and then again improved was shifted to our department, but patient again developed upper GI bleeding on 13th August. 
and was managed subsequent. So our working diagnosis was decompensatory cirrhosis of liver due to Wilson's disease with 22 weeks of pregnancy, esophageal varies grade two, three, with a first session EVL done, urinary tract infection, hyponatremia, bullous lesion of my skin, with history of hepatic encephalopathy and variceal bleeding, with child birth score 12C and male score 10. Now the problem list. As what patient has severe distress due to abdominal distension, recurrent upper GI bleeding and hepatic encephalopathy. So any further step needed for neurological improvement and decision regarding continuation or termination of pregnancy. Thank you, Dr. Rahman. Uh, this is not only exciting case, but it's a complex, very, very complex case. Um, any pregnant patient uh, with any medical underlying medical condition, especially any underlying liver disease, and then a uh, patient got pregnant, and uh, especially the liver disease like Wilson's disease, which is a rare disease, and there are a lot of limitation. Um, and on top of it, if you patient has cirrhosis, that makes it more uh, challenging. And so I, I think, uh, you know, to me overall, the course and the treatment all are, you know, excellent and appropriate. Um, the, uh, the couple of things I would like to make comment and uh, I have a couple of questions for you. Um, I have, uh, so I'd like to hear answer from you and then I'll go to panelists also. So um, it seems like, you know, I'm not sure what was the reason there was the medication was discontinued. Um, I think her medication was discontinued by um, um, a physician. I'm not sure a physician or, or patient stopped. And then of course the, her disease progressed. And, um, and one of the main complication of uh, uh, cirrhosis during pregnancy, you see is a very cell bleeding or very cell hemorrhage. And you, you will begin to see during second trimester, which is in this case, as you see, uh, they came in with very cell bleeding and uh, twice patient had it. And um, uh, usually, I mean, we in West, we try to avoid trolipressin in pregnant patient. I mean, we usually try uh, octiotride uh, because of being pregnant, we try to avoid, but it's probably a different practice in Bangladesh. But uh, so that's one thing. The second thing is, um, as far as it, her neurological symptoms, if you, uh, you know, when you begin your case, the tremor and the Parkinson syndrome and all that, these are part of Wilson disease. And also limited consciousness was, was due to our uh, progression of, you know, one of the complications in cephalopathy get worse and, you know, get appropriately treated for that, especially that get worse when somebody gets GI bleeding. So when you get GI bleeding, this is one of the precip precipitating factor for worsening hepatic encephalopathy. Uh, as far as the termination of pregnancy goes, the, uh, as long as the bleeding um, has, uh, you know, has stops, patient is uh, uh, stabilized. I mean, she, she's what, right now, 22 weeks of pregnant currently. So, so one thing uh, in addition to, I, I, I miss, I probably missed the medication list. I don't know the patient, how the blood pressure is doing and uh, using uh, non-selective beta blocker, uh, something to use it to prevent future bleeding. So either natalol or propanolol, uh, something, I don't know whether I didn't uh, see if the patient was something you should consider. So to secondary prophylaxis, and, and I'm sure the patient received antibiotic at the time of the variceal bleeding, you know, uh, because to prevent SBP. Um, now UTI, UTI was already resolved, right? The urinary tract infection was yes. already, okay. Uh, so other medication, you know, patients already on it, uh, lactulose and is the patient's lactulose? I didn't uh, see it here. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. There is lactulose. Oh, syrup yeah. lactulose. Okay. So Zyfax and d penicillamine and uh, all other antibiotics. So um, can you tell me why the patient is hyponatremic? 117 is, I mean, the you know, cirrhotic patient tend to have a low sodium, um, but it's, um, you know, much lower than you see in uh, cirrhotic patients. So it's, it's, it's slight, you know, it's lower than. And the second question I have is, uh, I was trying to think about it, a uh, bullous lesion in the skin. And what do you think about this? So those are the two questions I have for you and also for the panelists. Uh, uh, so the hyponatremia, you can see the decompensate cirrhosis, but it's much lower. So one positive could be, um, you know, patient um, did receive, um, did have uh, you know recurrent GI bleed, um, um, so patient there 
Although she has hypervolemic hyponatremia, I don't know if there is a component of hypervolemic or not, or any other etiology of uh, worsening of hyponatremia. Because uh, I think it was five or six days ago, her sodium was completely normal, right? You show me the chart, if you can go back the chart. The sodium level I think mentioned. So this is, oh, this is actually 2020. This is in, uh, is it August, 2023 or? Yes, it was in August uh, and the patient then, as because the patient was again shifted to ICU, further investigations were uh, done there. But uh, I am here showing only the latest investigation reports. Uh, gotcha. As as we are talking right now, the patient again was uh, shifted to ICU due to right. her deteriorated condition. So correction of hyponatremia, that's one of the important things because the, you have two preceding factor. One already uh manage which is uh, bleeding very still bleeding the second one is hyponatremia can also precipitate hepatic encephalopathy so that's something uh, also uh you know uh, i'm sure that's why a patient was shifted to icu because of you know uh, electrolyte imbalance and and change in mental status so uh, so i'd like to hear from me about the i don't i'm i'm, I'm trying to think about bullet solution in the skin so i'd like to hear from you and the panelist um uh, um uh, I will start with um, Professor uh, Abdul Rahim. Yes, thank you. I am hearing you. Okay. Uh, uh, now I am telling about this patient, and she is very unlucky. And she is now in ICU. Today morning she delivered uh, dead baby, and after then she was again become unconscious, and now in. Uh, I see you in a very critical position. Seven days before, we have uh, done a board by obstetrician, gynecologist, anesthetist, ICU specialist, and also hepatologist, gastroenterologist, and decided to terminate the uh, fetus. Uh, and then uh, to, uh, today morning, she delivered dead fetus, and now she is in critically ill. We have, uh, for the last two months, we tried very much for this, this patient and uh, after giving some, she was given unconscious, goes to ICU, come back from ICU to liver unit. And then our, after bleeding, uh, we have done um, EVL and she go, uh, went to ICU, but then she become, um, she is well and come to liver unit, but her ascites was very tense so that she was, Hyponatremic, um, tense ascites. This is very much uh, uh, uncomfortable for her. And there are two things happen for these patients. Uh, some of the graduate physician um, uh, uh, stop are uh, phenicillamine, and another is she become pregnant. These two things are very uh, crucial for her. And now she is in grave ill. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you, Professor thank you. Rahman. Uh, thank you. Uh, it it is you're absolutely right. It is very complex, and it's especially with the pregnant patient. Sometimes it's difficult to make a decision or a judgment call. Um, uh, you know, uh, she's young, and then you know, uh, with the baby and everything. But uh, uh, sometimes it's difficult. It make make a judgment call. You know, uh, what are you going to do? But most of the time, you end up uh, saving the mother. Um, so uh, the next. Um, uh, panelist, I would like to go is uh, Dr. Um, Alok Kumar Raha. I'm not sure if he's still here because uh, we're not able to uh, get his opinion from the other cases. Um, if not, then I will go to Professor Adnan. Thank you. Uh, this is a very complex situation. Uh, as you all said that uh, the discontinuation of penicillamine is a uh, very a risky thing. Now, uh, the patient has decompensated cirrhosis as, as well as neurological phenomenon. And uh, the bleeding and encephalopathy, uh, the two major complications are there and recurring uh, once they are improving and again, they are recurring. And at this stage, uh, termination of pregnancy was probably a, a right decision. Now, uh, let's see the 
uh, encephalopathy, whether it improves or not. And uh, for GI bleeding, as you have mentioned, we can add non-selective beta blocker very conveniently and uh, see the uh, recurrence of bleeding again. And if uh, that occurs again, we can uh, go for another session of uh, band ligation. Uh, that's uh, we can do for this stage. And I don't know uh, what to say more about this stage. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Adnan. Uh, thank you for your input. Um, now I will go to, um, is the patient, oh, by the way, is the patient still on presser or, or is still patient is hemodynamically stable? Sir, currently the patient is not hemodynamically stable. Uh, blood pressure patient is requiring a number of support to maintain her blood, uh, blood pressure mm -hmm. and uh, the encephalopathy and other causes are being managed in the ICU. Uh, we mm -hmm. shifted the patient this morning as uh, uh, with the consultation from gynean and fetal maternal medicine department, uh, uh, we decided to terminate the pregnancy before 24 weeks as the okay. patient is currently 23 weeks plus. So induction was given and then the uh, patient delivered the dead fetus this morning and then was uh, shifted to ICU. Uh, her condition is not actually well enough, and but the family didn't even give permission to start uh, ventilation. So uh, they are trying to continue the conservative management as per possible in their ICU as because the ventilation uh, permission was not given by the family members. So uh, now lactulose, how is the patient getting lactulose? Is the patient is like- The uh, patient was uh, getting the medications by NG feed actually with uh, lactulose or, or uh, and then again, uh, a parietal enema was also given to ensure bowel movement. Okay. Yeah, with the, with the vi a recent varicell bleed, one thing you may consider just um, not to, I mean, already NG tube is in, but um, you know, giving anima or you know uh, more frequently, like every three four hours. I mean, since the family doesn't want to pursue um, any ventilation or you know or, uh, or intubation, uh, if the patient is already in pressure, uh, so it's my bad. So I thought patient is hemodynamically stable, so we cannot use beta blocker anyway. So the patient is already uh, you know critically ill with the uh, on uh, with the vasopressor. So. Uh, but the enema would be would be um, more frequently because if the fam you know with the mental status changes, patient may aspirate. The other thing, if the uh, if the patient is already the, a on presser, and uh, uh, you might uh, want to consider changing the antibiotic to more broader spectrum, something like um, you know artepenem or something uh, broader spectrum, and adding you know coverage uh, for the also vancomycin, uh, the, you know, the resistant organism. So that's something, you know, would be my comment. So next I will go to um, Dr. Atik, Atik Bhai. Uh, he probably uh, left. Uh, so, and I'm not sure Professor Farooq, uh, was able to join or not. I know he was on his way to uh, Kuakata. So I guess he's going for a family vacation. So I don't want to bother him again, but uh, this is very challenging and very interesting. All cases are really, really very interesting. And uh, so lastly, I'll hear from uh, uh, my friend, uh, Professor Mamoun. Yes, that's right. Mm -hmm. Please go ahead, my friend. Uh, see, uh, there are certain issues uh, that is on the display in the screen. Uh, so uh, what to do with these issues? Uh, so this is actually a very difficult situation to manage. We uh, it it's not that we don't see uh, uh, pregnancy uh, in cirrhotics, uh, though it is, should be a very uh, you know unusual thing, but we do get such patients, but our experience is uh, uh, very poor. Uh, uh, I have, uh, I can count, I have so far seen only two patients uh, in my entire length of career, the hepatitis who have managed it, uh, both the mother and the child have survived. And this I was, the, the other day I saw a patient uh, in the last trimester, last four weeks to go, 
and that they are doing well. So uh, whether uh, you should, uh, we should be continuing. Uh, I think uh, uh, with the limited support that we have in our country, uh, we don't see uh, patients uh, uh, going uh, that far. So yeah. if you, I don't know whether that's ethical to say, or ethical to advise or whether the right thing to do, but uh, I strongly discourage uh, my uh, pregnant, uh, my uh, uh, female patients to become pregnant, and those who become pregnant come to me at an early stage. I strongly advocate a termination in those cases. Uh, yeah. Having said so, here abortion is a uh, legal method of uh, contraception in Bangladesh. So I can yeah. advise that, I can advocate that, which may not be the case in a country where you are uh, practicing. Mm -hmm. Because right. uh, my experience is very poor, and uh, other issue is that here in such cases, we have to manage manage the patient uh, with a uh, gynecologist that is also something not always achievable in many of our setups uh, in a private setup that is not always doable even bsmm setup you know uh, uh, a patient gets a uh, uh, you know uh, uh, bad at uh, an odd hour of uh, the day uh, uh, so theoretically many things are possible but practically these are not uh, very useful usual things to do uh, and uh, for the recurrent GI part, GI bleeding part, uh, here also uh, uh, my approach, uh, as I you know tell my students, is uh, not in this case only. Usually, uh, I tell them that see, guideline is not bible. Guideline uh, is there uh, so that you don't uh, malpractice or don't you don't cross the limits. But suppose in a situation like Bangladesh, uh, where uh, suppose a patient bleeds uh, uh, in uh, Dhanmundi area or in BSM or uh, one kilometer from uh, BSMU, he may take you know about two hours to reach BSMU. Uh, and uh, if he reaches an odd time, there may not be anyone to manage the bleed. So what we do is uh, we uh, emphasize on prophylactic uh, varicell band ligation uh, for whatever the reason uh, stage in history is. Uh, if we get viruses, uh, which are uh, you know uh, 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 eligible for ligation, we ligate them. Uh, and uh, our logic is that uh, you know uh, in a country like us, where we have limited resources, and even when the resources are there, there are many barriers like traffic and this and that, we should not take chances. So, uh, so if you ask me uh, to summarize that uh, for bleed, I will tell the patient go for banding, whatever you have, whether you have bled or not, I don't want to know. And uh, if you're in early stage, uh, then uh, go for abortion. If it's an advanced case, let's pay for the best and let's try together. Thank you, uh, Mamun. It's it's uh, you made so many great points. Uh, I mean, I'm a Bangladeshi, so that's also my country too. So, uh, I mean, a lot of things I have changed. A lot of things I don't know because uh, I came uh, really early. Uh, I really didn't practice after my internship. So I just came over. So of course, a lot of the like ins and outs and nuts and bolts, I don't know. So those are those are really a uh, great point because you know you have to go by what the situation is. Like you mentioned, like banding, you know, all patients, like you may give, uh, what I understand, you may give a better blocker as a prophylaxis and outpatient, like the patient might not take it. They think, well, why I'm taking this medication, everything. So it's but better to do. But the... you see a band ligation is cheaper than telepresin in Bangladesh. Yeah, yeah. So why <laughs> well, wait for the patient to bleed and put him on telepresin? <laughs> it's better to yeah, ligate right. him, you know. Yeah, right, right. No, no, well, absolutely. You're absolutely right. So, uh, you know, so you have to go by situation. Uh, and especially since you mentioned, you know, the collaborative management, like with especially the, if your OBGYN colleagues are not like, uh, you know, uh, do you, in Bali, you have a maternal or fetal medicine, like a high risk uh, uh, maternal or fetal medicine physician or just OBGYN they manage it mainly? Only in BSMMU and maybe, I don't know, not sure, maybe in a two or three more hospitals, maybe the Dhaka Medical may have. Otherwise, mm. fetal maternal medicine is a uh, new subject. But, and uh, when I uh, go into the depth of their subjects, they are basically uh, everyone's doing everything. Okay. Okay. All right. So, yeah. all right. Now, it, those are really great point. I'm, I'm, I, you know, this is a session. It's also, I learned from you guys, you know, like what does, what in kind of situation, what to do. So those are like, you know, something for me to learn as well. So uh, excellent cases. Uh, I cannot thank you enough, uh, Mamun. The, those are so, in a short time, we always give you a very short time. I'm, I'm sorry for that. I, you know, we usually, you know, at the last moment, it's very tough to make all the cases and have everybody present the case. 
thank you very much. Uh, no, and thank like you very much for you know for uh, regular collaboration. I think that uh, you know uh, this will be uh, a good encouragement for our uh, students. Uh, uh, they are all you know sitting in my office room at the medical university at this hour 12 a.m so it shows that they are sincere and they are you know uh, working hard they can, could have been connected from their respective homes as well so you know yes, uh, I, I, thanks I, I mentioning that I mean, we have a uh, like a global summit coming up so hopefully uh, we'll have your resident present because it will be like you know a huge event like when you're we're thinking about like close to thousand uh, physician uh, you know so, and there'll be like presenter from Bangladesh and uh, from uh, across the uh, um, across the uh, globe, like, you know, USA, UK and some other countries. So, so hopefully we'll have that um, uh, event. And then of course, every three months, maybe we can uh, set a time. So we'll give you some time. And then uh, these are the case, you know, very complex, interesting, exciting, and I uh, would like to hear it will benefit both of us. And the resident will be encouraged for encouragement for that. No, for sure. See, I'm a hepatologist and I proudly say that I believe in the supremacy of hepatologists. So uh, as a hepatologist, I will request you that in the global summit, you will give us some exclusive time, a session for hepatologists, uh, hopefully. Yeah, we'll have exclusive we'll time. Request, we demand that from you. Absolutely. We'll have some exclusive time in, in that summit. I'll, I promise you. Okay. So... Uh, uh, and also, so I'd like to thank, uh, I think I think I probably left, and uh, Professor Abdul Rahim, thank you for your input. Uh, I know you're also at BS to see all the case. Very much. Uh, uh, Adnan uh, from Cox Bajaj Medical College. Uh, he's from Solimullah, so he's yes. uh, four years from uh, senior to me. So yes. uh, for attending that. And uh, hopefully we'll have, um, you know, other panelists who will join us. And lastly, thank all the presenters, Dr. Fakul Islam, Dr. Manna Shah, and Dr. Rizan Rahman. Thank you all. And uh, uh, it's already late, so thank you. Good night. And hopefully we'll have another exciting session in, uh, in uh, you know, two, three months or so, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. We are waiting. Thank you. Thank you, thank you all. Thank you, sir.